If you were to do a quick search online for fly tying materials, you're not just gonna find hundreds, but tens of thousands of different options. Getting into fly tying can often feel like walking down the aisle of your local arts and crafts store more than it does fly fishing. But that's what makes it awesome. You're able to use your creativity and make your flies unique and more effective. My name is Alex and I'm one of the team members here at Ventures Fly Co. And this is module three of our beginner fly tying masterclass. The goal of this video is to help categorize and clarify the most common fish favorite fly tying materials so that you'll be more confident the next time you wanna tie up a new pattern and start looking for materials. Now, personally, when I need to complete a really big project or learn a complex topic, I found it really effective to take each of the individual tasks or concepts and group them into broader categories. And so that's exactly what we've done here. We've taken the fish favorite materials and we've grouped them into nine major categories. Categories one, two, and three, hooks, thread, and beads. We tackled all three of those in sections one, two, and three of this module. So if you wanna take a deep dive into any of those, be sure to check out those videos. But today, we're focused on categories four through nine. Now be sure to stick around to the end of the video because we'll be talking about strategies on how to buy materials and develop your own material collection over time. But without further ado, let's dive in to category number four. Let's talk about feathers. First on our list is hackle. So hackle is so important to fly tying, it deserves a spotlight of its own. It's used for dry flies, nymphs, and even streamers. And the two most common types of hackle are capes and saddles. So if you were to look at this rooster, the cape starts near the head and comes down the back. The saddle sits just below the cape. And what makes them different is the cape has a larger range of sizes when compared to a saddle. So if you were to pick up a cape, you'll likely find a few feathers that you could tie up really small dry flies, all the way up to something you could use on a streamer. But saddles don't vary much in size. If you find one feather in that 14 to 16 range, that's gonna be very similar to the rest of the feathers in that saddle. If you purchase a high quality cape or saddle, that's gonna have enough feathers to tie hundreds, maybe even a thousand flies. And these aren't just your average everyday chicken feathers. These roosters have been selected and bred for over the past 30, 40 years, specifically for fly tying. Rooster feathers have stems that are thin and pliable, and their barbules are stiff, straight, and web-free. Absolutely perfect for tying dry flies. But we do need to distinguish between rooster hackle and hen hackle. Hen feathers, on the other hand, are soft and webby, making them absolutely perfect for soft hackle wet flies or nips. And hackle can be found in a wide variety of colors, both natural and dyed. Some of the most common are grizzly, brown, cream, light, medium, and dark dun. But something to keep in mind, not all hackle is created equal. Depending on the company, they actually have grading systems with one or gold being the highest quality and three or bronze being the lowest. And here at Ventures Fly Co, we use what we would consider and what most of the fly fishing world would consider the highest quality hackle on earth, and that's Whiting Farms Hackle. The feathers are super long, they're really consistent, they're really high quality, and investing in a saddle or a cape like this, it's gonna last you for years to come. All right, let's talk about the second feather on our list, and that's pheasant tail. This is a very common material, and a great example of this is the pheasant tail. You actually use it in four different ways. You have it as the tail, as the body, and for the legs and wing case. Another common feather is peacock curl. So going back to our pheasant tail, you can see that it's used right here on the thorax. And it's also the material used on the body of a grivis gnat. 
Another common feather is marabou. So you'll find that in a lot of streamers. Here we've got a woolly bugger. That's what the tail is made of. Next is cool de canard, or you'll mostly hear it called CDC. And that has a number of uses, but one of the most common is the collar around certain nymphs. Next, you've got turkey feathers. A great use for these are the wings on something like a caddis or a hopper. Next, we've got partridge feathers. These are also great for soft hackles. And then last in our feather category is goose biotes. These are often used for tails on a bunch of different nymphs. Here, you can see it on a copper john. Now, this is not an exhaustive list of all of the feathers used throughout fly tying, but these are some of the most common and frequently used. All right, let's dive into category number five, dubbing. Dubbing is a word that you're gonna hear a ton in the fly tying world. Now, I'm probably gonna get a little heat for this, but if I had to explain what dubbing was to someone who had never seen it before in their life, I would describe it as fancy dryer lint. You know, that stuff that you pull out of your dryer after a few loads? It's got a very similar texture and look, but it's definitely more complicated than that. Dubbing's used to create a, <laughs> kind of a funny term, a dubbing noodle and wrap it onto your dry fly, nymph, or even streamers. And there are three different types of dubbing. You've got natural, you've got synthetic, and you've got a blend. So natural dubbing is actually fur that's being cut closely from the hide and then blended together. So you've got hare's ear, you've got rabbit, you've got beaver, you've got possum, you've got squirrel, and then synthetic, it's not from fur, it's not a natural material but something that has been synthesized specifically for fly time. And so things like super fine, UV ice dub, Antron, and even metallic dubbing. And so blended dubbings are when you take a natural and you take a synthetic and you put them together. So like a hair's ear and a UV ice dub. You put those together and you've got this natural looking hair's ear with a little bit of flash from that ice dub. And so every type of dubbing is going to have different characteristics. And so one important characteristic is fiber length. So on one end of the spectrum, here we've got some rabbit, and you can see those fibers are quite short. And then if you go to the other side, you've got antron, and those fibers are really long. And then another important characteristic is texture. And so on the left, you've got that UV ice dub, which is very coarse, and you can compare that to the super fine dubbing on the right, its texture is much more fine. You can't even really see the individual fibers there in that picture. That's how fine it is. And so when we're attaching this dubbing to our thread and forming that dubbing noodle, that long and fine dubbing is much easier to apply than the short and coarse dubbing. So something like super fine dubbing that has a fine texture and long fiber length is going to be much easier to apply than something like ice dub that's more coarse and has a shorter fiber length. All right, let's dive into fish favorite material category number six, hair. There are a number of different hairs that are used in fly tying, but we'll just cover three that are used very often, and that's elk hair, which you might see on something like an elk hair caddis, deer hair, which is used in a lot of streamers or compared done dry flies, and calf body that you might recognize as the wings on a royal wolf, or it's also used in a lot of parachute dry flies. All right, category number seven, wire. We use wire a lot in fly tying, but there are different types of wire. The first and most common is metallic wire. So this can be used for ribbing on a nymph or to reinforce delicate materials like pheasant tail, and it can even be used for the entire body on something like a brassy or a copper john. And then there's also wading wire, which you'll actually wrap around the hook to make your fly heavier. The two most common are lead and lead free. Everybody has their own choice, and here at VFC, we opt for the lead free version for environmental and health reasons. And then last on our list, it's technically not wire, but it's pretty similar, so we threw it in this category, and that's tinsel. 
So there's different types of tinsel. You've got metallic or mylar, you've got pearl tinsel, and this is used for ribbing or give your fly a little shine. Can be used as the body like on a rainbow warrior or a little bit of flash on a flashback pheasant tail or hare's ear. All right, we're gonna dive into category number eight. But if you're feeling overwhelmed, don't worry. Remember at the end of this video, we're gonna talk about strategies on how to buy materials and how to develop your own material collection over time. But let's dive into number eight, and that is synthetics. Now this is kind of a catch-all category because like we mentioned, there are tens of thousands of different materials. And so we'll just mention a few of the most used synthetics out there. First is chenille. You're gonna use this for a whole variety of different flies and there are different sizes. So you could see ultra chenille on something like a San Juan worm. And this is a common material used on streamers like you might see on the body of a woolly bugger. You've got yarn. So you have something like poly yarn that's used for those parachutes on parachute dry flies or the wings on terrestrials like a chubby Chernobyl. And then you've also got stuff like egg yarn that's used to create egg patterns. And then we've got foam. This is used a ton for terrestrials and hoppers. Rubber legs, which are also used a lot on terrestrials and hoppers, but are found in streamers and nymphs as well. You've got crystal flash. This is used in a variety of patterns to give it a little pop and attractor-like qualities. You've got thin skin, which is something you could use on the back of a scud or as a wing casing on a nymph. You've got floss, which has a number of uses. You could use it on the body of a dry fly, kind of like a royal wolf, or as a flashy tail on a euro nymph. And then last on our list of synthetics is tubing. This can be used on the body of nymphs to give it natural looking segmentation. Now again, this is a very broad category. There's lots of materials that could go into this one, but these were just a few that we thought we would mention as you get started in fly time. And our last category, number nine, adhesives. First on our list is head cement. This has a wide variety of applications, but you could use a dab of this for extra support on some trimmed off thread or to secure a bead in place on a nymph. Next is UV resin. Now you've got thick, you've got thin, you've got different colored UV resin, but it all works the same. You'll actually squeeze this stuff out of a tube and then hit it with a UV flashlight. And that UV light is going to harden the resin on your fly. And so people have gotten really creative with this throughout the entire fly tying world. And then last on our list of adhesives is classic super glue. There are a number of times when you'll use this to bind down some materials or to make your fly more durable. All right, you did it. You made it through all nine of our fish favorite material categories. Woo! Yeah! Man, that was a lot of materials. I'm gonna have to like take out a loan or get a second job if I'm gonna start this new hobby, right? Fortunately, we're going to go through a few strategies on how to buy materials and develop your own material collection over time. So the best advice that we've heard from a number of different tires and one that we completely agree with is buy the materials for one pattern that you use often, learn to tie that fly, then move on to the next pattern. So for example, I love the zebra midge. I use it all the time. It's a simple pattern. It's great to have in my box. And so I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna grab the materials for that pattern. I'm gonna grab some hooks, I'm gonna grab some beads, I'm gonna grab some wire, and I'm gonna grab some thread. And then after I filled up my box and learned to tie that pattern, I might choose a different color thread and make a bunch in red instead of black, or I might move on to a completely different pattern and get the materials I need for that pattern and tie a bunch of those. And so as you follow this strategy, you're one, filling up your box with a bunch of effective flies. Two, you're catching fish on flies that you have tied yourself. And three, you're building up your material collection, pattern by pattern, material by material. But even following this strategy, you might find that you have some bulk or excess materials that you're just not gonna get through, or one of those materials is out of stock and you can't tie that pattern. 
And so that's exactly why we came up with our tying kits. We wanted you to be able to pick a pattern, have all the materials you needed to tie it, and not have any excess or waste. They're pre-proportioned, they're ready to tie, and if you've been following along since the beginning of the course, you also know that we have a beginner material pack that pairs with this masterclass as we go through the bits method in module four. And if you're curious about any of those, there is a link in the description. So that's the end of module three. In module four, we're gonna start learning all of the essential tying techniques through the bits method and start tying up some flies. See you over there.